Bless you. That was awesome uh, leading your worship. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I came with on my heart today was about the fire of the Lord. And in essence, giving you the tagline, often in the church, because we've had so little of the fire of God for empowerment, we have majored on the fire of God for removing the dross. We have focused on our humanity rather than on his glory. And there are two fires that fall on us as Christians. There's the fire that burns the dross, the work that conforms us to the image of Jesus. And there is a fire of his glorious presence that says, I make my ministers as flames of fire. I make my people as God. I put a fire in them. Who would want a people that weren't on fire, filled with the flame that comes from the very throne of God? Why did the lamp burn before the altar of the Lord day and night and night and day and it was never to go out because in us that fire is meant to burn day and night and night and day and sometimes just because we hit a few bumps in the road we're back to reflecting on the fire that burns the dross but it's, it's he's wanting to put more and more of his glory on us that's actually visiting us at this time it's more and more of that fire burning that it was really, we're jumping out of our skin going, my God, you're, I feel your heavy weight when I come into your presence. Just even for my quiet time, I feel it waiting on me. Would you put your fire on me? It's not super spiritual to want to be conformed to the image of God. He wanted a people that burned, not just with passion, but they burned with the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord was what burned on the altar to remind the people of what was coming, that what they were in was a shadow of what you and I have available today. And we're, we're going to talk about some things today that, that helped us separate from that old identity and bring us back to a place where we can, with confidence, reach out and accept the fire he's putting on us in our nation. And this is probably... Because we become a global society. There's nothing happening in the world today that you can't find on some form of media. We, have, we are not even neighbourhood in a sense as far as the move of God. He is doing a global thing because he has a global audience. When you looked at the nation of Israel, it was a tribal thing that was happening because that was the one tribe that was listening. And then he poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost and immediately infected the many nations that were there on the day of Pentecost. And he said, this is how you'll know that my spirit's been poured out because people from all different nations will hear the Lord speak as one language to their heart because they would be filled with the Holy Spirit and no longer would a man teach them but the Holy Spirit would teach them directly that they would know the Lord. This is how we know it's been poured out that the nations were touched, but now we live in a global society. And his move, everywhere we look right now, and many times people would say, oh, we've never seen this before, but we literally haven't. Literally every country in the world is quaking with uncertainty as many are trying to orchestrate things for their outcomes. The devil's orchestrating. In Australia, we've... we've pro we have a government the closest to communism and socialism that we've ever had. We are the generation, my age, my parents' age, above me, they fought that coming into this nation. Now they're legislating socialism and the, a blend with socialism, Marxism and communism into the laws that are going into our nation because it's a global agenda. You will own nothing. Anyone heard that one going around? But we'll own it all. Hi. But you won't be happy, they will, because they want it. You're just in the way of what they want. And the agendas are so brazen, they're so out there. And why would God want... Um, I won't get ahead. But at this time, we are in transition. What is God wanting to reveal in transition but the glory of the Lord? There's a scripture we quote... And if you look at you know, the Lord of the Breakthrough in de detail, you understand when he talks about the Lord of the Breakthrough, it, it actually is this image of wave after wave after wave thunderously coming in until everything in front of it just breaks and smashes and moves. Imagine an old log jam, the bottom of a dam after a flood. 
Wave after wave after wave of flood hits that and smashes that. That's the Lord of the breakthrough, that which stands in God's way. That which says, oh, well, I'm going to defy the living God because it's in the image of Lucifer. He said, well, I'll rise up my seat above his. Everything that's trying to rise itself up and establish their seat over the nations right now, God is getting ready to roll out a move of his spirit that is going to blow that. Because he said, my kingdom will keep increasing in glory and power and word and deed and miracles and healings and governance and reformation of society. At the same time the enemy will be building theirs, I will be building mine. We're looking for a total absence. It's not scriptural. It says two kingdoms will fight and one will win. But he's pouring out his spirit far and beyond what we've ever asked or thought or, or perceived. And literally the nations, literally that scripture, many have quoted it before, but like it's never been more real than it's been today. Why do the nations discuss together how they might pull down the Lord? What futile thoughts have they got is written in Psalms. How, in, how incompetent would they be at dismissing the Lord of hosts who've created everything and whose kingdom is coming, ready or not, and is here now even. So we, we're in such a, a period of transition. And to, if, if you've been around a long time, and I'm young, but I have been around a long time in the church, <laughs> I have been saved uh, coming up for 45 years so I was saved at 18 I really loved the story about the motorbike thing the night that I got saved I was on drugs and drunk and I, and I locked myself in uh, I was at my mate's 18th birthday party and I locked myself God had been moving on me visiting me I was having dreams before I ever got saved I said like, why would I be driving riding around on my motorbike preaching the gospel who would do that but it's true enough I got saved and um in a great, glorious place, I locked myself in their toilet, knelt down on the floor and gave my life to the Lord. <laughs> and from that, I said, I need to get out of here because <laughs> it was just a party that I shouldn't be at. And I rode home. I had no intention of riding home that night. And I remember going over the, the bridge and there was a couple of really great bends I used to love to get into. And as I got into the bends, I couldn't actually, I did not have control of the bike. God was getting me home safely. So I really relate to that. So that was my first, you know, I was only a few hours saved. And um, God's riding the bike home because I was incapable. <laughs> um, but I was um, saved in the lead up and, and as the charismatic era was rolling out. When traditional religion was being rolled over as irrelevant with the, um, the 60s, and, and the free love and, 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 and how relevant was the previous generation and the putting down of all the social morals that held our society in strong fabric. As that was coming, God poured out a move of his spirit, which we call the charismatic era, because the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit was restored to the church. That ushered in a transition that took us decades to come to grips with. God in a day can do something that we take decades to catch up on because he is always so deep, so much further down. Uh, he's gone so much further in preparing a way for us than we can comprehend or think. The Lord says, my ways are greater than your ways. My thoughts are beyond the reach of your thoughts. But to those who pursue, he said, I will, I will unpack those things. So when we moved into the charismatic era, we didn't know what we got. And people were being saved and, and had a home group, a church group, then it was a hall group, and the next thing they were a pastor six months after getting saved. Because the churches in the tradition at the time would not come on the move of God. They stayed, most part, the pastors, the ministers, ministers in those days, they stayed where they were. So God used those people. But as we, who went and saw the movie The Jesus Revolution? who saw that with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on people that had no foundation in their life was lost, like the net had holes in it because God had to work with the people that gave their life to him. And they were passionate and they were sincere. But I saw most of the people that put their hands up as pastors, they crashed within three years. Most were, were no longer. 
Because God did not have a people that were prepared, but he still wanted to pour out his spirit. We've had 40 years. I count it as 50 now if you look at the origin in the movie. It's 50 years since the pouring out of the charismatic move. The most significant move um, that went global um, that's been recorded up to this time. More people came into the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit than at any other time. And now you and I, a lot of people in this room, not all, but we've had decades of preparation. We are not broken nets anymore. We're not just mended nets. We are reformed in the image of Christ's nets, able to carry his glory, able to be representative of the glory of the Lord, what it really is to be a Christian, what it really is to carry his power, what it really is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what it really is to know that you know that you know who you are, that you are his beloved. You know what it's like. You've been through the flood. You've been through the fire. You've been through the refining. And as many people say today, you are not about to retire. You're about to refire. <laughs> because it's, it, is, it is not age. The, one of the things that is a, a false teaching, it's a, it's a misrepresentation that is out there. And I, I, there's not many young people in the room, so I'm not here to offend them. Uh, as in, you know, there's not too many of us under 30 in the room. But this teaching where oh, all you oldies, you need to step aside. This is the young people's move now. It's their time. Well, that is totally unscriptural. You asked a Jewish family what that looks like, they would absolutely reject it. Because when the generations are still together and give honour to one another in your distinction, that is where the presence and the favour of the Lord falls. To separate one group, to preference any group, be it a nationality, be it a generation, be it a certain background, be it a certain uh, a wealth, anything, any separation in the house of God is an abomination to God. We can read it all in the New Testament. When the wealthy got a better seat, when the poor weren't fed, when we didn't, when we discriminated against a certain uh, ge um, racial background, it was never, ever, ever re re reflected a standard God raised, and He always put, He always addressed it. To say that the that this generation, in general, those of us who have been around for a while, would step back to make room for another generation and to bow out without putting in the wisdom, the wealth, the support, the prayers, the finances, the energy that we have gained in being in his hands for so long is false. And, and although we want to see our children exceed the things that we achieved, it's un, it is a, it is a cop-out to step back and not step up. It's backing away from what God is about to do. And, and I've got some friends, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm quite shocked. Um, these are very mature Christians, and I visited them with them um, it's, it's a, in the last couple of years. But basically, in that year... Oh, no, Jesus is coming back in October. Like, you know, it's like all the words around the world are coming around. Jesus. This, the gospel's gone to every country, every nation. I said, no, it's never gone to every... Um, when they do the analysis of every tongue and nation, the literal words was tribal group, and there's still something like 4,700 different distinct groups of people that have never been reached in the earth. Like if you looked at, say, the Islamic culture within a particular nation, those people have a different set of beliefs and a different way they, they um, do their lives, and that is a distinct people group. So it's not, And so if we said the gypsies, no matter which country they're in, they would be within that country a distinct people group that have got to be reached. To so simply say we knocked on the door in Italy, and that, that covers the whole nation, no. Um, but they were saying, no, just, and, and these are mature, mature, mature Christians of decades. And basically said, no, we're sitting back now. We're just waiting for the free ride out. This kind of stuff is getting around. And I know it's not being taught in here. <laughs> Suzette will never let a day go by. <laughs> Bless you, Suzette. We'll never let a day go by that we didn't fire up to be all that we could be in God, for God, and with God. But we, we want to come into that fire and so one of the things I, I want to share with you, there is a structure to this, that proximity 
will often determine our revelation. Proximity in terms of where God puts us at a certain place at a certain time with a certain people, and we have different aspects to our life. I'm not just talking about your workplace or your, your home. You know, uh, I'm saying God puts you in proximity in order to bring to you understanding that you could not get unless you're in proximity to that particular people, situation, whatever it might be. Some examples of where even um, good meaning people who have gone and said, well, I just don't feel that they're welcoming me here, whether it be a workplace, whether it be the church, whether it be the group, that your social group, and then we've packed up our bags and we've gone somewhere else. We've relocated ourselves. And would not realise that in doing so, we actually forfeit the grace that was being offered to us to come into transformation through the contact with those people. And sometimes even in our, our biggest challenges, God is not willing to budge on this issue. So I think of Elijah. He left the city, went to the mountains to seek God. And, and he'd been, he'd been uh, he's down and testified. He called down the drought. He called down the judgment on the government at the time. He called down all those things. And then he got the death threat and he ran out of town and he ran up the hill and he put himself before the Lord. And the Lord came past in this form and that form and, and all those other things. And God spoke to him and said, um, uh, let's just cut straight to Elijah. You're a, mature, you're a fairly mature bloke. What are you doing here? This is not your place of proximity. Get down from this mountain and go back to the people. Why are you here? Did you think you needed to leave your assignment to hear from me about continuing your assignment just because your assignment got hot? That, I mean, that's, that's the guy that we credit, the birthing of the prophets. You know, when we think of the prophets and the law, we quote Elijah and Moses. And God did not pull any punches. He did not say... Well, I understand they didn't really make you welcome there. Yes, I noticed you, your, your picture was on every sign on the way out of town. Wanted dead, not even alive. <laughs> Jezebel has a personal thing for you. And has a lot of guys out there looking for you everywhere. And uh, I understand, no, he did not make any room for that. There's some things that God has decided that we need to do, that we need to be, and places we need to be, that are inseparable from not only our, our, our assignment, but also our development, our transformation into the nature and likeness of Christ. And he's not going to give us negotiation on some of those things. In, in our world today, I can go out and look up thousands of ads and think of taking a different job. And if, and if you are... Um, and, and this is not uh, bagging this out, but if you're a single person, you can go to thousands of websites and, and make a selection of someone that you might want to date. You could go down to the local shops here and you will have not one grocery store, but probably seven within the same shopping centre even who want to give you a choice. A God is not like that. He's not a negotiator. He is God. And uh, he's saying basically, when I gave you an assignment... I gave you an assignment. Stick with it. I'll tell you when it's over. You, don't you worry. I won't leave you there. I'll give you plenty of opportunity to, to move on to the next one if you are faithful in the assignment you're in. But we have this choice thing that has been bred into us and it comes from independence. See, proximity in God's mind is where he locks us in with what we need to move into what is going to be needed to move on from. Our provision is there. The grace is there. And when we move ourselves, and we see many particularly who pursue it in leadership, whether it be leadership in the church or leadership in their job, they'll often just go, well, I just, I, it's about time I got that particular next job up the, rung up the ladder. It's about time in the church I got recognised and got to preach or lead, lead the youth or whatever it might be. That is not written in the book of Proverbs. That is not written in the Psalms. That is not written in the history of our faith. It says those whose ways please the Lord, he will honour. You see a man who's good at what he does or a woman that's good at what they do, as in they have the touch of God on them and they're, and they're developing something in, the, being developed into something in God's hand. That person will not stand before fools but will go before kings is the promise from God. 
And promotion only comes from the hand of the Lord. He, he is not into select your options. That, and so sometimes we find ourselves being asked to step up even. So sometimes we're in the way and we choose to get into another channel. We don't want to go through this path. It's not pleasant here. People put me, people don't recognise me. People maybe don't think well, don't think highly enough of me as I think that they should. They, should, they really recognise what I've done or been through or brought or have in my life that God's developed. But humility is the key to any um, access to anyone's heart. If we don't have humility, it's very hard to win anyone over, isn't it? And God is using those day-to-day -day events in order to build humility in our life. Saul was a guy who didn't aspire to being king. Um, this is King Saul. He, he didn't go out there and go, I just want to let you know, God, when you're choosing the next king, just look over here, I've, I've been thinking about it, oh, yes, I'll take the job. No, when they came looking for Saul... He was hiding in the baggage. Like, the baggage is at the back. It's probably the last thing you pass before you hit the latrines out the back. <laughs> He's getting as far away as possible. He says, I just want to make sure, even though Samuel prophesied over me, I don't want this job. At that point in time, he was quite humble. At that point in time, he, he couldn't believe that God picked him. And... He was placed into the calling by Samuel, who anointed him first privately and then publicly as the next king. And he was put into proximity with Samuel. If he needed to know something, there was one person who was the judge at that time, and that was Samuel. And, and we see this almost separation between faith and government even in this first kingship in the nation of Israel, where Saul took his own counsel instead of going back to the place where he received the anointing from and honoured that by staying in intimate fellowship with Samuel. And if he had stayed in fellowship with Samuel and said, I know nothing about leading a people. You've anointed me. you put something on me. I see the nation follows you before they followed me. How about you train me how to be a man to be followed? What would be the history of Saul if that had been the case? Sometimes God says to us, I think of an example in, in my life, I, and some of the, they're mostly in messy situations. You know, the most promotions have been offered to me was when it's also messy and they're going, you haven't moved quickly enough, we'll grab you. Or so it might seem on the lateral level. But I remember in the, one of the first churches I was in, there was a pastor who I greatly respected. He was actually known as one of the original the ministers in the, in the Penny Charismatic Move, uh, Pastor Gordon Gibbs, this is in New South Wales, and he actually has quite a legacy that he developed, quite a man of faith. And I was attending a small group church that he had, and, um, and, he, and, he, and uh, he came up to me and said, I would like you to lead worship. And he had a lady who was a professional singer, and her husband was on the keyboards. And I'm going, uh, they are class A, I'm class unknown. <laughs> why would you want me there he said well, I have my reasons <laughs> and you know he was a wise guy he didn't share with you know early 20 year old something Jeff I go okay alright well okay did you tell her about this because she seems to be the leader at the moment he said yeah yeah I've, I've told her she's going to make some room for you to start leading some songs so if you remember some of your early training you'll love some of this story because you've probably been in those same spots. So yes, I get my opportunity, which I didn't ask for, and I would have the songs worked out that I would lead and then hand back to the other leader, as you learnt in part. Well, she would start a different song than the song we launched with. <laughs> she would cut it off at a time that I wasn't expecting, or when I had paused, she would keep it going. Anything and everything that just humiliated me because she was, she was a control person. She was not full of spirit. She was control. And I'm going, I'm going I'm like, this is just, this is not a place to learn. This is a place to get humiliated. This is terrible. And I'm going, why is the pastor allowing this? 
See, we, we, we turn our attention to almost blame the godly before we actually blame the devil sometimes. And I went to him and I said, this is killing me. Like, I, I, this person did not get the memo. I oh, know they got a memo, they just didn't get the right one. <laughs> so it became evident that he wanted, what he found out was actually these people were starting to create their own home group and pull people out of his church. And he was getting ready for, the, for that separation that was going to affect his church. He was being subtle about it, but he wanted a worship leader ready to go. And I kept persevering, and it was the most painful, painful experience. And, um, and, and, and at the time, the relationship that I was in did not stand the stress of its own strain. So I removed myself from the proximity of that little fellowship. And I can't even count today how much I lost for doing that. Gordon Gibbs was a man who's still written about today. He walked with God in a phenomenal way. And I, I in my um, youth, did not recognise the opportunity that was offered to me. And I removed myself, going, I'll, I'll go somewhere else. And to be mentored by a person like that, that God gives you favour with, took decades for me to be offered another relationship like that with someone who had such a heart and such an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. When we remove ourselves from the proximity of where God put us or we take on a different attitude, um, God does not owe it to us to fix it the next week. Some of those relationships are unique. Some of those pairings are so totally, totally unique that uh, we, we might need to walk uh, without that in our life for a, quite a season before being offered again. Um, the next person we could look at would be Gideon. Gideon was an interesting character because he's down in the wine press beating out his little share of the harvest at night because the Midianites were stealing all the grain and um, driving their people to starvation and poverty. He didn't offer to anyone else in Israel, by the way, I've got this thing going, if you like to creep around about 10 o'clock, we'll beat out your grain as well and you too can have a bit of provision. No, he's just, he's just my four and no more type of guy at that stage. He's just thinking about what needs to happen for his life. And God visits him. And at that point, the angel says, Hey, almighty man of valour, you've got an assignment for a nation. He said, hang on a minute, why aren't you feeding us? He's missing the assignment question again. Many of us have been offered things and where we are fixated at the time that the opportunity comes to us with something else that we feel is a more pressing need. It's like many times we come before the Lord with a question and we're desperate. God, you've got to tell me how to fix this. You've got to tell me how to get my kids back. You've got to tell me how to fix my finances. God, you've got to, got to, got to, got to get me out of this. And God comes out and says, just put all that aside and let me cut through. I just want to offer you this. And at the time, we're going... It doesn't add up. I'm rationalising, I'm using human reasoning. and I, So then I actually don't even honour what I'm being offered. I often put it aside because, well, that's nice, but what, I'm, what I've single-eyed about is this one thing I need. And I think what I really need is this particular problem. I think of a lady that my wife went to pray for recently who had served uh, in my wife's ministry many decades ago and served in the church and been a very faithful lady and served in her brother's church. And she went and saw her at the nursing home and she was in the last, uh, last week of her life. And she confided as she's there and she said, Faye, you know, could you tell me why didn't God give me a husband? She had been uh, divorced by her husband 30-something years earlier. And all her time in the church... If you had a conversation with her, that was in the conversation. I'm, I'm waiting for my husband. I'm waiting for my husband. It's like, instead of all the things that God could be offering, sometimes we're putting up this one thing. If I had this one thing, that would make me happy. If I had this one, if people just recognised me, if I had this one thing, if I had this one thing, and that lady died 38 years of her life, significantly wasted, unfruitful, 
There's one question she insisted God must answer before she would hear any other answer. And I think of the grief of her children who tried to reach her and couldn't get past this question. Of the people in the church where she served who looked to her for leadership and, and she was quite a you know, helpful and friendly lady. But they, they would have been driven away if they got too close by this one question. Sometimes we carry something that we don't realise is such a barrier to even receiving the very intimate words of the Lord over our life. Because we've held something above um, trusting him that he will give us everything we need at the time we need it, in the way that he wants to do it. And handing over our life to say, you are sovereign. We love to quote sovereignty when our nation's out of control. God's sovereign over Australia. But we go to work the next day and argue about the boss we've got that's rude and aggressive and... You know, my son-in-law's just gone through a, um, a job thing where he was equal to another fellow, but the other fellow used a whole stack of um, unreasonable methods to achieve his job. He'd pump other people for information, pretend it was his. Um, when he got to present to his managers above him, he would uh, call meetings and not turn up at them, or he'd call meetings and never let no one else talk. And eventually the business offered both of them to apply for a particular role, and they gave it to the other guy. And he had, and this happened over, first of all, the two businesses amalgamated and they met with this guy and they got to, yet to decide who was going to lead who. Then they put the teams together, had three different stages and every one of those stages he said, it didn't go the way I wanted, but I'm going to trust you, God. It didn't go the way I wanted, but I'm going to trust you, God. And this is like, that's eight or ten hours a day for those that are retired. Um, <laughs> you know, that he's working with this fellow who has no ethics, got the job that he wanted, doesn't do a good, competent job for the business. And he is dedicated and committed. And so he, you know, every day you're going to go to work and go, is this going to get under my skin? Is this going to become the definition of my acceptance or, or my success before the Lord? Is one job, one promotion, is that going to be where I stop my searching the heart of God for what I need in my life? It could be. That we, recognize, we need to recognise that our destiny, ultimately, that God's called us to, requires us to stand where God has appointed us to at the time of the particular assignment we're in. So an assignment is separate from our destiny. So right now, my assignment is the particular job I have. And with the work the Lord has done in my life over many, you know, I'm a very slow learner, many decades, my Boss is a young man, he's 34 years of age. His father and mother still work in the business. He's a second generation. He's now the managing director. And he, he literally calls me his work dad. My job, most of my time, is just to counsel him in how to build that business. He, he, he spends more time with me than anybody else. Every cup of coffee, every lunch, every problem. Yes, he talks to other people as well, but he'll spend most of it. It's basically sort of like, I've got my dad over there who actually didn't really impart that much to me. I've got this dad here. And this dad, he's the one who's got my heart, not the one who actually raised me. That's, that's my assignment. Now, if I remove myself from that assignment, no matter how well the next offer might be or might be more convenient, I currently travel two and a half hours a day commuting to and from work, um, if I remove myself from that against the what would be the impact? It's quite humbling to have someone go and say, you know, you're not just an old dude, but you're my work dad. Yeah. You know, God to give my generation access to the next generation and together he and I are changing the culture of a business. That to me is what we're all looking for in the church that together with the other generation, we are together. The wisdom, the experience, along with the strength of the young, the, the, um, the zeal. He's got a lot more energy than me, of course. But I need to recognise that's my current assignment. My destiny is to do that on a larger scale. But I'll never get to my destiny unless I complete my assignment. I'll never get to hear the wisdom of God's path for me unless I submit to this assignment with my whole heart. 
I'm not looking for options. I'm not looking for, well, how long am I going to be here, God? I mean, I can, I have been that in the past. I don't, I'm not saying I'm that phlegmatic personality. I'm actually more of your choleric, make it happen personality. But in this, come to rest because you're there where God's got you and there's grace. The other thing that when we remove ourselves from proximity to where God appoints us is if the grace that we have today is sufficient for today and the grace that we need tomorrow is there tomorrow, when we jump ahead of the process of God, we move to where there is no grace. If I move to the next job in the process to get to what I think is my destiny, if I self-promote myself, I actually forfeit the grace that I need to function in that calling at that time because I'm actually not in the grace timing of God. I'm actually gone to where? Not that God won't love me. There's, not, there's no, no forgiveness of sin, but what I'm saying is the grace that makes the fit, the grace that makes the flow, the grace that makes acceptance, the grace that brings favour, the grace that keeps me with sharp ideas, the grace that gives me the ability to... Um, to to, um, to do that distance, to do that time, to go the dis distance until God says it's time to move to your next one. I would forfeit that to be out of timing. It's not... Many times if you think about things honestly, you'll recognise times where, you, where you've made a certain move and sometimes you made it with the best knowledge you had but you landed up somewhere it just went really hard, really fast and it was a grind and it was just like you were down there in the land of Goshen making bricks. No straw, just mud. Started with a bit of straw and next thing she's just mud and it's just hard work and there's no respect and there's no grace and it doesn't flow. You know, it's one thing to be trapped in Goshen because your parents bore you into the world in Goshen but many of us actually take a self-promoted trip to the land of bondage because we don't actually honour the ways of the Lord and we find ourselves out of timing. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal concept and it has multiple generational impacts on what you and I do with what we're called to do because we are not an island. We are in God's scheme, we are a multi-generationally faceted individual. He is rooted in family, he is rooted in the generations. In fact, one of the greatest judgments of the Old Testament on individuals and on leaders was when they did not want to raise up and invest in the next generation. It was one of the great judgments that came on the nation of Israel. When they did not invest in the next generation, God was really displeased and God really did not work with them because that multi-generational aspect is the nature of the heart of God. He is family. He is generations. So I want to um, take us for a quick trip through the life of Naomi and Ruth, a story that most of us are familiar with. The book of Ruth opens with, in the days when judges governed Israel, and that was possibly um, Samson at that time. Um, there's some debate on which judge it was. There was a famine in the land of Canaan, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live temporarily in the country of Moab, with his wife and two sons. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left a widow with her two sons. They, and then in verse 4 of um, Ruth chapter 1, it says, They took wives from Moabite women. The name of one was Oprah and the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years and then both Malion and Chilion, the two sons, also died. So the woman, Naomi, was left without her two sons and her husband. Elimelech, as the, as the father in a patriarchal society, would have made the decision to go. There was a famine. There was a reason to go. So one of the things that they say historically, what would happen is why people moved from one nation to another at those times was they would not have had enough assets to cash in to keep paying the increasing price of grain in the famine. You know, scarcity creates price increases, and that's why people had the kinsman redeemer that God had, re had put in place, because people went into debt in order to eat in famine and then they gradually bought themselves out of debt when they got able to work and bring prosperity back into their lives and buy back their debt. Or if, they, if that was beyond them, every 50 years everyone one was released in the Jubilee 
or you could come into a kinsman redeemer relationship where that person would buy you out of widowhood or whatever it might be by by taking you into their family El Elimelech has decided they're going to see out the famine by going to another country, a country that is renowned for the, of worship to false gods. Um, and he's not there very, we don't know how long, but it just, it just says period, then he's dead. Now under their, under their law, the sons, the eldest son in particular, now becomes responsible for the mother. That's the, the eldest son replaces the father as the head of the family and also has to provide for the mother. So Naomi would have been dependent upon her, the eldest son, um, which if you read them in the order of their names, um, that would have been Mal Mahlon, M-A-H-L-O-N. So she's now, she's now, first of all, under her husband, she leaves everybody she knows. She leaves her covenant people and she's over in a foreign land. He's dead, then the son takes over. The two sons make a decision out of what has been ingrained into them by their father. They too look at the moment in need and go, well, not much is going to change. We're here. We'll just take local wives. We won't honour the word of the Lord in, our, in the Torah and not marry foreign wives. We won't wait for that. We're old enough we just, and we're not going to go back. We're just going to live here forever. No real connection. You know, it's interesting the father has broken in the line, the lineage of that family for however he did it, but he broke that connection to the Lord and the house of God and the, and the family. But what we see at the end of the time that it says 10 years after they married, both daughters-in-law had never born any children. There's no children mentioned. And Naomi's there and says she's actually devastated because both sons are gone. There's no provision for her anymore. There's no sons to provide for her. And she says, I'm going home. There's no one. See, so the son, if the eldest son said, I'll provide for you, she would have had to stay in Moab for as long as he ruled. She was already trapped under her husband. Now she's trapped under the son. She goes, I'm going back. I've inherited two widows, and us three widows are going to go back. But what she didn't realise was, and we can see the character of Naomi not only in the story, but we realise... All through that 10 years, those daughters-in-laws were her daughters-in-laws before this moment came. She had been sowing into them the truths of the ways of the Lord. She had been imparting to them about the faithfulness of God, no matter her circumstances. She had witnessed over and over again to what it's like to be in covenant, to not be under false gods, but to be in covenant with the living God. She had imparted so much to these women that even she got a shock when she said, as she started to start the journey home, she said, no, it's a wrong decision. You're a Moabitess. Uh, you guys need to stay with your nation. They'll like you. You can marry again. You're young enough. It'll all, you know, you, you stick with your people and I'll go back to my people. And Ruth has this interaction with her. It says, not on your life. In the bundle of life, my bundle of life is in your bundle of life. Your people will be my people. Your country will be my country. Your destiny will be my destiny. I will not let go of what you put into me. You put covenant relationship into me. I want it. I'm staying in proximity to you, Naomi. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in proximity. And we know the rest of the story that as Ruth trusts Naomi, the Lord puts Ruth in proximity to Jabez. And then again, Naomi, who has the wisdom, ability to hear the wisdom of God, says, Hang on a minute, God's at work here. This is what you need to do. And then we get the outcome. It's interesting, even in the lineage of this, we look at, we know that Ruth ultimately became the great grandmother of David. So when, we, when she went into captivity, they were in the time of judges. David was the, was the second monarch. The name of the children, the, the son born to Ruth and Boaz was Obed, which means worshipper. Then we get an interesting uh, name for Jesse. We know David's father was Jesse. And the meaning of his name is the Lord exists. And we know that when um, Samuel came to Jesse's house and asked to see all the sons, Jesse f spoke so lowly of David that he didn't even consider bringing him before Samuel. 
And even David said in the Psalms, I'm the son, I'm the illegitimate son, so my father's my father, but the wife was something else. And that's what that verse was, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, an, I'm an illegitimate, um, born in sin. It wasn't he was saying that you know, God hated him, he was saying that the father's name was the Lord exists, Jesse. About as good as a Lemelech. Yeah, God exists, but I'm not going to follow him. I'm not going to let him make my decisions for me. I'm not going to stake my life on trusting his covenant. And we see that in the very behaviour of Jesse towards David. and We see nothing where uh, Jesse celebrated. Neither did any of the sons celebrate David's accomplishments. The Lord exists. Yeah, but I'm not changing anything. I don't expect anything. I'm just going to do what I always did. But out of that, though, came David, meaning beloved of God. Now, you and I go through seasons where we, we're looking for good things to come out of bad situations. But if we keep our eyes only on the situation, we start to only expect that the only thing that's going to come out of the situation that will fix it is our own efforts. And we remove ourselves proxim from proximity to where God has placed us. You know, Naomi would not have fought for that first 10, 15 years that she was in Moab, that anything good could come out of this. In fact, she came back to her family and said, I've actually got pretty bitter out of this. So she must have had a better season in her life before the two sons died, where she was imparting into Ruth and made such a big impact on Ruth's life. But she had to deal with her own bitterness to recognise that God actually, when she got back in proximity with her own people, and restored herself back there, everything and more happened in her life to the point she became, she held, it says when Ruth bore Obed, it was Naomi holding the child on her lap. It was Naomi, all the wives, the mothers coming around, Naomi, Naomi, look what God has done for you. Naomi was the heroine of the story, but spent a lot of time in captivity. You know, you and I sometimes... Um, leave ourselves in places we shouldn't longer than we need to. We over-empower other people to have decisions over us. Well, I'll go when this person says this. Or when, you know, I know people even want to come to the lucky dip of the prophet. Oh, well, you know, I've got this big decision to make, prophet. I was like, since when does a prophet take away your personal responsibility to hear from God for your life? That's a dangerous dice to roll because it is because God says you put anything before me it's idolatry even if it's one of my gifts it says but the prophecy works by love and love embraces truth so you know we should be looking for the word of the Lord to be already in our heart we're looking for the truth to be confirmed by the love that comes to us through the word we receive so this big transition there sometimes and, I, and I'm, so why, why are we talking about proximity so I feel that uh, in preparing for today, the Lord has a number of us here. There are places you can think back to. And I had a dream um, early Saturday morning um, that brought this to me, that there were people in our past that offended us greatly or were used to tell us that we would never be welcome at the table, whether that table was in our job, in our acceptance, our social settings, skill sets, family. These judgments that, that we are disqualified by these voices bring to us when you believe them, when we take them to heart, we feel, you know, if we feel that cuts to the quick, they take away our prosperity, they take away our sense of favour, they bring poverty to our life, poverty of spirit, poverty of finances, because we'll make bad decisions if we operate under that kind of judgment. It will rob every aspect of your life, your relationships, your finances. It'll be hard for us to get further without actually coming into being over overwhelmingly transformed by the love of Abba. I'm beloved. Those judgments are not me. I am not the sum of the voices and the words other people have said about me. I'm always valued by the words he says about me. My total value, when you add me up, is everything he has said and written 
over my life. And he started writing that before you were born. He started writing the book of life for you and me at the time he created you and I well before the earth was formed. I want a Jeff. I want a Debbie. I want a Gail. I want a Sam. And this is how I'm going to walk with them. This is how I'm going to lead them. This is what I'm going to put in their personality. This is the doors I'm going to open for them. This is the places that I'll take them to. This is the delight we'll have together, to walk together, to know each other intimately, to share those things. But if we're still holding um, those things, that's going to be a challenge for us. So I'll give you another example. So many years ago, I had been to the States to Bill Hammonds, and I spent six months in the States after doing Bible college. Bill Hammonds uh, ra credited with raising up 40,000 plus profits. And, uh, and it was my passion, I had passion for the prophetic. And, um, and I came back from there. And uh, when I came back to my home church, they said, oh, you're back. Uh, you'd be really comfortable over there at that church down the road. <laughs> In the, while I'd been gone, the senior pastor had to take over a higher leadership position in the church and the associate pastor had become the pastor. And uh, sort of basically sort of like, yeah, don't settle down too quickly. We're offering you this great opportunity of going somewhere else. And I went to this other church. I so said, okay, well, I'll relocate. And, um, and, and the church invited, the um, church started to talk to me and say, if we're running these conferences, how would, how would we do it? So I'd start to talk to them about management and, and how to set things up and things like that. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what are you doing at the moment? I said, I'm looking for a job because <laughs> I'd relocated and come back from the States. And as I'm praying um, early in the morning, um, I just had this sense of excitement. Oh, God, you know, they possibly might approach me about doing something with them. And God just, just immediately just started dealing with me. And he said, I want you to stop holding me to ransom. Uh, um, 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 hang on a minute. How, does, how do I hold you to ransom? He said, you have expectations of what I'm going to give you because of what you've been through. Because I've been praying this out loud in my prayer time as I, I was walking, you know, just wanting up my little tiny balcony in this very old flat. And um, okay. Yeah, God, I, you know, I went through that and just looking for when you're going to give me a, give me a great place. And he said, he said, we're not going anywhere until you um, decide and accept I owe you nothing. Everything you went through, you can't hold me to ransom. I owe you nothing, Jeff. You can't walk through this next door until you deal with this. You're not going anywhere. I don't owe you because you sacrificed. Didn't you do it because I sacrificed for you first? I don't owe you because things didn't work well. I don't owe you because people spoke poorly of you or misjudged you. I don't owe you anything and I'm not going to be held to ransom. And I was just like, the truth of it really hit me. I was shocked because it was my great Leverage. Oh, you know, we don't want to write off the past and go, we went through that for nothing. We think somehow it's going to repay us. Somehow in achieving our destiny, we think we're going to be able to lever that to crack open the door and in we come. Finally, recognition or, or finance or, or families being restored, all the cause of something we've done. But we have no right to leverage God no matter what we've gone through. The Apostle Paul said, I count everything, everything as worthless compared to knowing him. He said, if I was to receive a reward, it would be only at his discretion. He disassociated all sense of reward and earn and deserve. Earn and deserve is the basis of religion. Earn and deserve is the basis of an unequal relationship. We are in an in unequal relationship with God. He has done everything for us and we have literally got not much to give him back other than our lives and our worship and our service. It's an unequal relationship. And he says to us, I have balanced the scales by grace. You don't need to come to me with a sense of 
false humility because you owe me. But don't you dare tell me I owe you. And as God dealt with me, I was pretty shocked. What? Because I, when, and I must admit, you know, I stood there and I go, "If this is God, and it is, what have I got left to but open it? What have I got left that I can make life happen with? That was that was my bargaining chip. That was my leverage. That's how broken a mentality that was. That I would think." This gives me some surety of what the future might look with, look for, might look like. Sorry, because uh, I can call, I can say, oh, "This, I've got this." And you know, I was in in this dream. I was surrounded by a person who was, who in his mind, I was never going to qualify um, as being anyone of worth to him. He was a, he was a generation above me, and uh, he was an elder on the church, and he was. Uh, father of the daughter that I was dating and everything about his life that he pulled himself up from the western suburbs to live in St Ives and, um, and it's like you just don't think you're going to get anywhere I was, I, was, I was dirt coming to visit the house, I was dirt when I visited the church and, and God was just reminding me sort of like you know every time you look for affirmation in a person you will not only be disappointed, but you're going to come under manipulation, even if only just by yourself. Because any time we have someone's acceptance rise up above the acceptance of Jesus, we are on unsure, dangerous ground. Because if they give you that acceptance, then you owe them your loyalty. And Paul said, Owe no man nothing but to love. And love does not control. It doesn't owe. It doesn't add up stuff. It doesn't weigh it in. It said, owe no one nothing except to love them in a godly way. And so as I was, you know, as God was unpacking this dream to me, a lot of what he was bringing this person back to this, the dream I had on Saturday morning, he was talking to me about people and this message. And some of us have got people in our life that really were, in our mind, door stoppers for us. They stood in front of something that we felt we should have been allowed to pass into, something we felt should have come our way. Whether it be a, a former spouse, um, a former employer, a former church leader. Many of us have, you know, church is a very political place, unfortunately, uh, if it's not led by the Lord. And uh, there's many conditions and hoops you have to jump through to uh, succeed in a lot of places. But if today, as, as we're going to look to the Lord, I really want to challenge us to be honest with ourselves to the voice of the Lord. I believe he's going to speak to us. He's going to nail for us what we, like me, did not See, even needed nailing. I thought it was something to boast about. And he brought me right down. So it's not only is it not worth boasting about, but it's actually quite offensive that you would try to hold me to ransom Jeff. You would say, I owe you. And, and that was not, it was not a pleasant encounter, but it did turn my life around. See, repentance is to change the way we think. And when we do not think and value things as God values them, we are prone to even offend him with our, our rational, earthly thinking of, of, of it's based upon getting ahead or getting something we need, and it's not godly. But today he's giving us an opportunity to take it to heart and to seek him and say, is there something, Lord, that you want us to deal with? So we're going to um, just have a time of... Um, um, a song that I'm just going to play in the background. I want to read you some of the words of this song. This is why Jason Upton is called In the Silence. The power of silence before the Lord is like one of the biggest hammer weapons you could pull out. When we can still ourselves, and we know how, in, in, with maturity and regularity, about to put ourselves in a position where all I'm aware of is the heavy weight of his presence 
And I am just in awe that he's there. It's transformationally powerful to any and every situation. And, and in a lot of ways in our Pentecostal history, in our desire to be the happy holy rollers and to express our faith, we have lost the silence. The words of this song, which I'll, I'll play in a moment. I'm tired of telling you, you have all of me, when I know you really don't. I'm tired of telling you, I'll follow you wh wherever, when I know I really won't. Because I'd rather stand here speechless, with no great words to say, if in my silence is more truthful, and my ears can hear how to walk in your way. In the silence you are speaking, in the quiet I can feel your fire, and it's burning, burning deeply, burning all that is in me that you desire to be silent. We were talking before about the fire, and we are singing about the fire, that there is a fire that burns the dross. There's rubbish. We could give it some really unfiltered names. Sometimes it really smells. And I've, and I've had my stuff. I've had to, that God has gone and said, we're bringing the fire on that. That stuff stings. But it's because there's another fire he wants to burn in that silence that you and I would know what it's like to be the literal lamp of the Lord and burn before his presence with a holy fire a holy fire where there's nothing between us. So when, there's, when all of that is removed, not just in this moment, but we want to see God move in this moment, but as we move closer and closer, his fire, the lamp of the Lord, will burn in us and burn in a way that everyone around us in our lives will know it burns. And there won't be the sense of regret. There won't be the sense of... of um, unworthiness or not having received our due but we will feel we are exactly where we're meant to be we're in his hand and nothing but nothing can take us from it so we want to reflect and say God God we're asking you Holy Spirit right now to start to touch us you've been speaking to us and wanting to transition us transform us through repentance, through changing our thinking about some of the things that we have formed as core values that actually come from nothing but the fallen nature of the enemy as he's indoctrinated us with our entitlements and maybe our sense of being owed. But Lord, today we recognise that you went to the cross knowing so many would give you nothing but a spit in the face and a nail through the hands and feet. But you gave anyway. You held nothing back. You gave everything you did right to the point of death and humiliation. And because your sacrifice was so pure, the Father accepted it in our place, as you died for us, you positioned yourself where we couldn't position ourselves. We were too selfish and blind and wretched to do it. And you put yourself there. Today, we don't want anything to stand in the way of what you brought us and what you've done and to redeem us. So Lord, if there are things in our life right now that you've been, you want to speak to us about, or maybe you've started to speak to us about, relationships, places where you were doing something that we did not in our circumstances and our maturity understand what you were doing. But right now we can see that it wasn't you the way we handled it. It wasn't godly. It wasn't the outcome that you desired for us. It wasn't your leadership that led us away. It was our own weakness, our own determination and we have this wonderful opportunity Lord you're the God of yesterday today and tomorrow you're the God who redeems our yesterdays and in this moment I thank you for the power of redemption Lord that we can step back into that moment and invite you into it 
So God, I'm so sorry. I didn't understand what you were doing at the time. I, I, I put my, what I felt was my needs ahead of what you offered. And if I'm honest, I actually spat in the face of the wisdom that you were trying to put into my life to lead me in your ways. And I determined I felt there was a better way. And in doing so, I rebelled and I stepped out of grace. And you don't judge me for it, but you want to clean me up. That our relationship would burn with the lamp of the Lord. Our relationship would burn with a holy fire. We want it to be a holy people as you called us to be. We want our hearts not to condemn us in any way, any memory, any circumstance. I just want to hand it to you. Cleanse us, Lord. We just ask your forgiveness. We picture that person, that situation, that moment, that struggle, that, that trap we felt we were in and we didn't know how to get out. And we knew you were saying to wait longer for the answer, but we just bailed because we couldn't take it any longer. We fought. But you had a plan. You're not a God who abandons us. And maybe for some of us that's what we felt. Maybe that's where we were. Rejection ruled our life. Because it's, it's what put us on the other side of the cross. And maybe we say, well, that's all I had at the time. Well, this is the time to bring that before him. So God, redeem this. Redeem the years the locusts and the canker worm have eaten off my life. Redeem those years. Cause me to be a fruitful bough that breaks out over the wall. Let me go beyond where I am today. Some of you have, have capped out your expectation of what life looks like from here. And if you've been living with a devourer like this in your life, it will cause you to feel capped out. But it says, God says when things are put into right order, we will bountifully become more and more fruitful and break out over the wall. He's wanting to break out in our life. He's wanting to bring us into the plans and purposes he has for us, to break us out of where we are. And in dealing with these issues, he is coming in with his grace, saying, I'm going to break you out of that devouring thing. Because unforgiveness and selfishness and, and, and feeling abandoned are devourers. There's nothing they can add to us, only take away. 